Tokyo, a city of 13 million people. And standing at the heart of this megalopolis, stretching towards the sky, stands the steel silhouette of Tokyo Tower. This year marks the 50th anniversary of this landmark structure. As well as being one of Japan's signature sightseeing destinations, Tokyo Tower also played a key role in Japanese society during the post-war era. After TV broadcasting began in 1953, people in Japan were captivated by this new medium. Tokyo Tower was built to deliver TV signals to eastern Japan. It was the world's tallest tower, and it lifted people's hopes skyward as a new Japan rose from the ashes of war. Now half a century has passed, and the tower's days as a broadcasting facility are drawing to a close. A new TV transmission tower is being built in Tokyo. This time on Begin Japanology, we introduce Tokyo Tower, a central pillar of the television era in Japan, and one that has a special place in the hearts of Japanese people. Hello and welcome to Begin Japanology. I'm Peter Barakan. Today I'm standing in front of Tokyo Tower, one of the best-known symbols of Tokyo, and a magnet for tourists, both from Japan and from overseas. The tower is approaching its 50th anniversary. It was completed on the 23rd of December 1958, and at 333 meters high, it immediately became the tallest structure in the world, beating out the Eiffel Tower. The two towers look very similar, but they were built for completely different reasons. The Eiffel Tower was built in 1889 to coincide with the great exhibition held to commemorate the centenary of the French Revolution. It was originally intended to be dismantled after the exhibition, but then the French military started to use it for wireless communications, and after that it became designated as a structure essential to France's national defense. Tokyo Tower, on the other hand, was built a mere 13 years after the end of World War II, at a time when Japan faced the massive challenge of rebuilding after the devastation of the war. First of all, we'll take a look at the reason why the tower was built and its significance to the Japanese people. Thrusting elegantly up to the sky, this is Tokyo Tower. Even now, 50 years after it was built, it remains one of the most distinctive landmarks on the skyline, drawing people's gaze. With a total height of 333 meters, it is still the tallest self-supporting steel structure in the world. In Japan, the first sunrise of the year is considered hugely significant. The observatory on top of Tokyo Tower is crowded with people as New Year's Day dawns. It was so beautiful, I was really moved. I'm sure this will be a great year. Tokyo Tower is especially popular on this auspicious morning. It also draws numerous sightseers throughout the year. And over the past half century, it has welcomed some 150 million visitors. The years after 1945 were a time of chaos and deprivation in Japan. People faced a daily struggle for survival. But in 1955, ten years after the end of the war, Japan's recovery was gathering steam. The next decade would be a period of extended economic growth. It was at that time that plans were formulated to build the world's tallest tower in Tokyo. Television broadcasting had begun in 1953, and it was already a popular new medium for entertainment. People would gather around TVs set up in the streets to watch professional wrestling, cheering on local hero Ricky Dozo as he vanquished his foreign opponents. The TV era had begun. At that time, many new TV stations were being set up. But if all of the networks were to erect their own broadcasting antennas, it was feared that Tokyo's skyline would soon be cluttered with towers. So it was decided a single giant broadcasting tower should be built, 
to transmit signals for all of the broadcasters to the entire Kanto region around Tokyo. In 1958, Tokyo Tower started its life as a TV transmission tower. On April the 10th, 1959, some 15 million people watched live coverage of the parade that followed the wedding of the Crown Prince to Princess Michiko. It was about four months after the tower went into operation. In 1964, the Summer Olympic Games were held in Tokyo. This was the first time that the Olympics had been broadcast live on color TV. During the games, lights were placed up the sides of Tokyo Tower in celebration. This proved popular, and even after the Olympics ended, the illumination continued every night. In 1988, Tokyo Tower celebrated its 30th anniversary. To mark the occasion, the illuminations were upgraded. Instead of the lights just marking the outline of the tower, the entire structure was bathed with floodlights. This display had a major impact, changing the look of Tokyo's nighttime cityscape. In recent years, many different events have been held at Tokyo Tower. A special stage on one of the observation decks is used for evening musical performances, with the city lights as a backdrop and it's become popular as a romantic spot for dating couples. I love it. It's so beautiful. It's like a father figure. Japan's father figure. Most people just take it for granted. Tokyo people don't visit it much, I guess. But sometimes they just like to see it. Times have changed, but Tokyo Tower continues to attract numerous visitors remaining one of the city's best-loved landmarks. Most people think of Tokyo Tower as a tourist attraction, but in fact, where I am right now is the most important part of the whole structure. This is the trans transmission room, or rather it's NHK's transmission room. Each of the commercial broadcasters has its own room as well. It's pretty noisy in here with all the machines, so I'm going to have to shout a little bit. Television images come in here by cable, and then in this room they're transformed into electromagnetic waves, then they can go up to the top of the tower where the antennas are, and they're beamed out to the whole Kanto region of eastern Japan. Television broadcasting in Japan began just as the country was starting to get back on its feet after World War II. The so-called economic miracle was around the corner, and in 1956, a government white paper proclaimed that Japan's post-war reconstruction was complete. As work was starting to get underway on Tokyo Tower, demand for electrical appliances was starting to build up too. And there were three items in particular that everyone in Japan wanted to have. A television, a washing machine, and a refrigerator. These became nicknamed the three sacred treasures named after the three symbols of power that were handed down over the centuries from one emperor to the next. These were a mirror, a sword, and an orb. Of the three modern-day treasures, the one that was number one on almost everybody's list was the television. Here we have a photo exhibition marking the 50th anniversary of Tokyo Tower. Most of these photographs were taken during the construction and they really capture the feel of that era. Tokyo Tower had a great symbolic importance for post-war Japan and the engineers who were responsible for designing it were given instructions by the government to create the world's greatest transmission tower, something that would give proof of Japan's recovery and also give a sense of confidence to the Japanese people. However, no one in this country at that time had any experience of building a structure on this scale. On our next video, we'll take a look at what it was that made it quite so difficult. The aim was to build, in Japan, the world's tallest TV tower. Although this massive project had government backing, there were numerous hurdles to overcome. 
The design of the tower was entrusted to 70-year-old Naito Tachu, who was at that time Professor Emeritus at Waseda University in Tokyo. Naito had already designed around 30 other towers in Japan, including the Nagoya TV Tower and the Tsutenkaku Tower in Osaka. He was known as Dr. Tower. However, Japan is frequently hit by typhoons and earthquakes. Because of the risk of building such a tall tower with steel, at first the government ministries were cool to the idea. But in financial circles, support for the project was gathering momentum. Investment came in from newspaper and film companies that wanted to get in on the TV business. Steadily the time for starting work on the world's tallest tower was getting closer. In order for broadcast to reach the entire Kanto region, the tower would need to be more than 300 meters high. Initially, it was hoped that it would reach to a height of 380 meters. However, that would have made it too susceptible to swaying, to the point that it might affect transmission. Naito reduced the height coming up instead with a design for a tower that rose 333 meters high. This was still 20 meters more than the Eiffel Tower in Paris, until then the tallest structure in the world. The next problem was the weight. To be the tallest in the world, it was estimated that the weight of the tower would be around 4,000 tons. Tests on a simple model illustrate the problem of supporting that weight on four legs. Steel balls, each weighing 10 grams, are loaded onto this wire model. One ball is added, then another. With the third ball, the tower collapses. The weight of the tower is channeled outwards, away from the vertical, exerting a force that pushes the legs apart. To counteract this force, Naito applied a principle that works much like these rubber bands. The legs of the model tower are connected diagonally by rubber bands, which resist the force pushing them apart. Will this keep the model tower from collapsing? Let's see what happens. Even when it's holding 15 steel balls with a total weight of 150 grams, the tower remains firm. To reinforce the tower's legs, a countervailing force was needed, like that supplied by the rubber bands. Instead of rubber bands, Naito decided to use steel girders heated to make them expand. As the steel cooled, the girders would shrink, pulling the tower's legs together to resist the force pushing them apart. The blueprints were calculated down to the last millimeter. The total weight of steel needed for the construction was 3,600 tons, half the amount used in the Eiffel Tower. The aim was to make Tokyo Tower not only the tallest in the world, but also the best engineered. In September 1957, a special ceremony took place with prayers held for the construction to proceed without accident. At that time, getting hold of so much steel was no easy task. To obtain the material to build Tokyo Tower, old tanks, formerly used in battle, were bought from the United States and melted down. Including scaffolding workers, blacksmiths, painters and other skilled workers a total workforce of 220,000 people was assembled. The scaffolders were responsible for erecting the steel skeleton. They had to work on girders that were just 30 centimeters wide. Operating in close teams, they fitted together the steel girders. The blacksmiths would prepare red-hot rivets and throw them to the riveters who would then drive them into holes already formed in the girders. Each step of the process, from preparation to assembly, required a range of specialized skills. By October 1958, the tower was 250 meters high. 
the final and most difficult stage of the project was about to begin, installing the antenna at the top of the tower. It was 94 meters long and weighed 132 tons. It was also a precision instrument, so the greatest care was needed in handling it. This was the most difficult engineering project ever attempted. On the 9th of October, work began. Slowly, carefully, the antenna was hoisted. But as it reached the top, the wind suddenly began blowing fiercely with gusts of almost 60 kilometers per hour. Work had to be halted. With the antenna stranded in the air 250 meters above the ground, and the scaffolders left clinging to the steel girders of the tower. After an hour, work was finally able to restart. With the wind still whipping around their precarious footing, the workers labored to secure the giant antenna. Finally, it was fixed perfectly in place with its tip 333 meters above the ground. The work to erect the world's tallest tower had been completed in just 16 months. Besides opening the door to TV broadcasting in Japan, Tokyo Tower was a demonstration of the expertise of Japanese engineers and skilled workers. I'm now on the main observation deck, which is 150 meters up from the ground, about halfway up the tower. If you look out of the window here, you'll see in the foreground Roppongi and a couple of the big towers of the recent redevelopments there. Behind that big tower there, you can see actually the NHK building with the big white satellite dish on top. And way over in the distance there, Shinjuku. Uh, people who've seen the film Lost in Translation will find one of those buildings familiar, I think. As you can see, there are quite a lot of buildings in Tokyo now at about 150 meters high. But when Tokyo Tower was built 50 years ago, it positively dwarfed everything in the vicinity. Once Tokyo Tower was built, the Japanese government began to focus on its policy of doubling people's incomes in 10 years, a feat which was actually accomplished even faster than that as the country began to enjoy a new prosperity. As the engine of Japan's economy moved from agriculture to manufacturing, so the population also moved out of the countryside and into the cities. And for job-seeking migrants arriving in Tokyo for the first time, the sight of Tokyo Tower really inspired their hopes and dreams for a better future. Even now, Tokyo Tower often features in movies and novels set in the good old days, a kind of shared sense of nostalgia. The tower occupies a special place in the hearts of the people who grew up right in its shadow. And on our next video, we'll take a look at one such family. This street in the heart of Tokyo leads directly away from Tokyo Tower. A small photography shop was set up here right after the war. Tajima Midori took over running the shop from her father. There are many photographs on the walls showing Tokyo Tower in its earliest years. This photo was taken when the tower was still under construction. In 1958, the tower could be seen taking shape just down the street from this shop. Here is the tower soon after it was finished, caught in the brilliant light of a sunset. The photos were taken by Midori's father, Matsunaga Juro. This photo shows some of the workmen who built Tokyo Tower. Matsunaga was allowed to go up to the 250 meter level to capture this remarkable shot.
When he got back down to the ground, his legs began to shake. He managed to make it home. But even though there was a mountain of work that he had to do, he went to his bed and pulled the covers over his head. Mother was furious. A series of photographs that Matsunaga took of the Tokyo Tower construction site were published in a photography industry newsletter. Under the title, The Demolition of a Park, Matsunaga's article raised questions about whether building the giant tower would mean destroying the surrounding park and its historical sites. Would children like Midori, his only daughter, lose this place where they could run around and play freely? As construction began, those were Matsunaga's concerns. But as the work proceeded, Matsunaga's feelings about the tower began to change. He shot some footage using an 8mm camera. Here he shows groups of children having fun, with the partially completed Tokyo Tower rising behind them. Matsunaga felt that a new era had come. He saw in that silhouette hope for the children's future. Here is some footage he took of Midori at that time, when the tower was rising higher by the day. They often went out together in their neighborhood. For them, the sight of Tokyo Tower had become a part of their lives, something that they treasured. When she was 22, Midori got married. She had two children, and no one was happier for her than her father. One day on August the 9th, 1979, Matsunaga went out to buy some film to photograph his grandchildren, who were visiting him in Tokyo. But he never returned from his errand. He was killed in a traffic accident. This is what Matsunaga's grandson drew in his diary that day as he waited for his grandfather to come home. A picture of Tokyo Tower. After closing up the shop in the evening, Midori steps out into the street. She is heading towards the tower. In her hands is the camera that her father loved to use. Midori has carried on taking photographs of Tokyo Tower because of all the close associations with her father it has for her. One photograph in particular has continued to pique Midori's interest. Her father took it from 250 meters up on the tower before the tower's special observatory was built. It shows the new houses and other buildings going up in Tokyo. A new era was taking shape. Midori stands looking down on the city in the same spot from where her father took that photograph. A half century ago, it was her father clicking the shutter of this camera. When Tokyo Tower was built, it was a time when everything was changing so fast. It launched an era in which old things had to be destroyed to make room for new things, I suppose. When I think about that, I'm glad that Tokyo Tower is still standing, just as it was when it was completed in 1958. Fifty years have passed, but it remains just the same. I really feel that it has a special place in people's hearts, for everyone. 
Since the end of the war, Tokyo has grown into a metropolis very different from what stood there before. Unchanged for the past 50 years, Tokyo Tower has watched over the city's transformation. During the last 50 years, Tokyo Tower has watched over the most dramatic changes in the history of the city as Japan recovered from its defeat in World War II, built up its technological prowess and evolved into an economic superpower. Tokyo Tower symbolizes that whole era for many people in Japan. However, the tower's role as a broadcasting tower will shortly be coming to an end. In 2011, all television broadcasting in Japan is going to go digital and a new transmission tower is being built across town to usher in the digital era. We'll leave you with a little video footage about that new tower and I'll see you again next time. Bye-bye. By 2011, all terrestrial TV broadcasts in Japan will be digital. In conjunction with this switchover, there are plans to build a new transmission tower to be called Tokyo Sky Tree. It will stand 610 meters high, making it one of the tallest structures in the world. It is likely to become the city's latest must-visit sightseeing destination. Even though Tokyo Tower's days as a broadcasting tower are drawing to a close, it remains a focus of a belief that is widespread among young people. It's called the Lights Out Legend. It's believed that if a couple watches the lights of Tokyo Tower being switched off, they will always be happy together. Midnight arrives. Dating couples watch as the lights go out, their eyes filled with dreams of future bliss. Tokyo Tower inspired previous generations with hope for the future. Today, too, it continues to have a special meaning for so many people in Japan.